Welcome to a gathering of friends. Uh, we'll record the rest of our work here in a video on we've gotten off YouTube from Ray Vanderlaan. Hope you enjoy it with us and uh, hang on with us. We'll discuss it when the video is over. The Jewish Passover festival is deeply rooted in the events of the exodus from Egypt. If you read that story in the Hebrew Bible, you discover a word that occurs again and again and again. The word is remember. Remember the night you put blood on your door. Remember when the angel of death passed by. Remember when you left Egypt. Remember when you were camped on the shore of the Red Sea and the Egyptian army was coming in the distance, remember. Remember's a word in Hebrew that's not easy to define. It implies an intense focus in a way that would allow that memory to shape you as you think of it, as you reflect on it. Jesus was a Jew. And so the end of his life was a collection of incredible teachings, unbelievable sacrifice, all focused on that ancient Jewish celebration of Passover. And he too said, do this to remember. Come, let's walk those last few hours with Jesus as he celebrated the Seder and then left and went with his disciples to a night of watching. We're here today at the place called the Bible Time Center to look at one of the most significant links between the Hebrew Bible experience of God's people, Jesus, and the people that are in him. And that is the experience of the Passover celebration, which on the one hand remembers that great exodus from Egypt and all that God did because of it, and on the other hand becomes the moment that Jesus fits himself clearly into the story and says, I'm now a part of your exodus. Come and be a part of my people. In the Bible, the first time, the first exodus, the first Passover, God brought his people to Sinai. When they were there, one of the things he did was to have the elders sit down for a meal after making a covenant with them or through them with Israel. A meal in that culture was one way of coming together with people who needed to be reconciled and resolving the differences. So it's as if God said, look, this covenant is my way of showing you my mercy and resolving the differences between us. Let's eat together. So in a sense, the Passover meal, the first one, all those in between, Jesus and what Jesus created, 
is a reminder of reconciliation between God and people and between people and people. But there's another major emphasis, as I'm sure you're aware, and that is that the Passover meal links together the great salvation experience of the Hebrew people with what Jesus came to do. And it provides an incredible picture of who we're called to be. Now, there is a question. Was that Last Supper held during Passover season actually a Passover Seder, a Passover meal? Not everyone agrees. I'd like to show you why I think it was. Come. Let's talk a bit about what that Last Supper was. Question is, first of all, was it a Seder? Was it a Passover meal or just an evening meal during Passover week? Well, I think it was a Seder, even though there is some question. And I think that for a number of reasons. One, in Exodus, God said, have the Passover meal to remember. The key of this is not a big holiday, simply or a wonderful meal, simply. It was. The key was to remember, I brought you out of Egypt. I saved you. Jesus came to that meal, and that's one of his key words. Do this to remember. And I think that suggests that the Passover, the Seder, would be the best place to picture remember, because that's what it's about. There's another reason. Notice the matzo. And the trays in front of you, we have matzo, which is unleavened bread. Leaven in the Bible represents sin. So God said, when you leave Egypt, leave Egypt behind. So no leaven at that meal, none, none at all, not even in your houses. So obviously, you use the bread that represents what God asked. And since Jesus is going to make this the picture of his body, it makes perfect sense to have unleavened bread. So that's first. Second, in Jesus' story, wine is mentioned, and more than one cup of wine, one before the meal at least, and one after the meal. And the wine is blessed, things that were done at a Seder. So again, it sounds a bit, maybe quite a bit, like a Seder. Third, at the end of the meal, Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn which is exactly what they did at the end of the Seder. And there's no record they did that at the end of an ordinary meal. Now, it's possible, but it sounds again like a Seder. So for at least those three reasons, I think the writers are trying to say to you, this was a Seder. But probably the most convincing reason is the Bible says they reclined. In the Exodus story, God said, eat the meal standing up. But eat the meal standing up because you got to be ready to leave. They left, and when they got to the promised land, they began to say, look, we're here. God has given us what he promised. We're in the land of rest. So it began to develop that at the Passover, you recline. So that in the Bible, they reclined around the table, contrary to most Christian art about the Last Supper, is very convincing evidence that it was indeed a Seder. You recline on your left elbow, and eat with your right hand. Now, you notice how you are, okay? At this meal, you're looking at the back of the person reclining next to you. So you carry on a conversation with the back of that person's head. If you want to talk to somebody behind you, you talk and you can't see them. Three sides, and the serving was done in the middle. 
Now, a legitimate question would be, do we know who sat where? Well, if I were to ask you, based on our culture, where would the host be? What would you tell me? Yeah, you'd say in the middle, at the head of the table. I don't know why we put the host or hostess there, but we do. For them, the last seat is the servant seat, and that's the one who would wash our feet as we enter. Probably normally be one of the members of the family of the household, because there's a high honor in serving someone. So it's not a dishonor, but that's the foot washing position, the servant seat position. And everyone else would find their places. Now, what's interesting to me is in the rabbinic world, there was discussion about who should sit here. Well, obviously, you put the rabbi here. Who's next to him? How do you decide who's honored? How do you decide who's last? And they discussed and debated. Should it be the oldest to the youngest? Should it be the wisest to the learner? Now, a legitimate question would be, do we know who sat where? Well, in their culture, the host seat, the most honored seat, is the second one in on that side. To his left and his right would be the seats of honor for those who would be next to the host. On the opposite side, the last seat is the servant seat. And that's probably the one who would wash our feet as we enter. When Jesus' disciples entered the upper room, there must have been some discussion about who's going to sit where. And I say that because almost immediately as the meal starts, they get into a debate about who's the greatest. And I think what may have triggered that debate is who sits here? So be kind to those disciples. It's not out of the blue they're starting to argue about who's the greatest. It's there's a reason why that issue came up. Shortly after the meal began, Jesus addresses that issue with foot washing. Now, let's try and ask, do we know where anyone sat, assuming that this was the position? If this is correct, and Jesus is here, we can be safe in assuming John is here, at least the disciple Jesus loved that most believe is John. Because the text says, John leaned back against Jesus' chest. And that's only possible here. Judas would have been here, believe it or not, because Jesus and Judas dip together. And in the custom, three people eat out of the same bowl. The amazing thing about that is, that puts Judas, who's already betrayed Jesus, in the second honored seat. And if that isn't like the character of Jesus, I don't know what is. I would like to suggest that it seems to me that Peter is over here. Let's look at that for a moment. Right in the middle of the meal, Jesus got up and he took a wash basin, poured water in a bowl, took a towel, and began to make the rounds washing feet. The text says, when he came to Peter, and I hear in that that Peter is somewhere down the line, because it sounds like he didn't come to Peter first, but after a bit. And that might argue that Peter is down this way a ways, in the foot washer's position. Then he came to Peter, put down the bowl, and knelt down by Peter's feet. Peter said, no way, I should wash your feet. Now, that may be because Peter is saying, you're the rabbi, you're the Messiah, no way. Or Peter may have been saying, look, that's my position. That's my responsibility. Either way, Jesus says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you can't be part of me. And Peter said, then wash my head and my hands too. A Jewish way to say, I repent. And Jesus said, no, Peter, you're already clean. You don't need to repent. I want to teach you about servanthood. Jesus is using this moment to address the who's the greatest debate, which came up because of the seating just before. When he was finished with that teaching moment, he laid the towel aside, and it says he took his robe up again. Now, I don't know if that meant he put it back on. Maybe that's more possible. Or he returned it to the place 
where he had taken it down from. I like that idea because that tends to be how rabbis teach. They like to make dramatic moments. Either way, he has now laid it down and taken it up. And what I find intriguing is in that same gospel, there's a story in which Jesus says, I lay down my life and I take it up again. Same phrases. No one takes it from me. Now, if I'm a disciple, remember, a disciple is someone who wants to be like the rabbi. How do you lay down your life and take it up again? Isn't really explained. I think it's possible, maybe probable, that Jesus used the foot washing moment to say, you want to know how to lay down your life? Remember that, that day? You want to know how to take it up again? Lay down your life for someone else and do it often. Now, if you would be more comfortable being seated, feel free at this point, because I'd like to look at now how that Seder meal went. The Passover is built around the number four. It's in Judaism what three is in Christianity. I say three, you say Trinity. Any Christian will do that. Three is not such a significant number in Judaism. Four is. In Exodus, God made four promises, which are the heart of the Passover celebration. Let's imagine we're with Jesus, and somewhere that evening, I am sure they recited the four promises. Say these words after me. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I will bring you out. From under the yoke of the Egyptians. From under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will set you free. I will set you free. From being slaves to them. From being slaves. To them. I will redeem you. I will redeem with you. With an outstretched arm. With an outstretched arm. And mighty acts of judgment. And mighty acts of judgment. I will take you. I will take you. To be my people. To be my people. And I will be your God. I will be your God. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. The very words of God. Four promises. I will take you out, I will set you free, I will redeem you, I will take you. Those four promises are the heart of the Passover celebration. Now think about them a moment. I will take you out from the yoke of the Egyptians meant tomorrow, you Hebrews, you aren't going to be beaten anymore. You don't have to make bricks, they won't throw your babies in the Nile. I'm going to take you out. And you say, yes, praise the God of Abraham. But you get out and you think, but you know what? I'm a slave. I don't know how to act out here. I've never had to make a decision for myself in years. And so God came and said, OK, and I will take your slave nature away. It's like an addict who stops using but still addicted. And then God comes and says, I'll take your addiction too. You won't even want it anymore. And they said, yes. And maybe they thought, but God, we're stained with the sin of Egypt. And God said, you're right. So I will redeem you. I will save you. I will clean you up with an outstretched arm, think Egypt, and mighty acts of judgment. And then maybe someone thought, but what if we go back there? And God said, don't worry. I will take you, remember Sinai and the marriage? I will take you to myself to be my people, and I will be your God. I'll protect you. Those are the four promises. Now, in Judaism, they developed the practice of drinking a cup of wine four times during the meal to remember those four verbs. Take you out, set you free, redeem, and take. Did they have four cups in Jesus' day? Honestly, the answer is we don't know for sure. My belief, my feeling, my understanding, it's more likely they drank at four different points to remember those four promises. So when I talk about four cups, I don't know that we can say, like today, there are actually four cups standing in a row. That seems to have come later. But certainly the idea that you drink a sip of wine at the point you remember the four promises can be argued much earlier, even in Jesus' time. 
So let's look at what happened at the Seder that night in light of those four cups. Picture the disciples, and we've put all men around the table because no women are mentioned, and I don't believe they were there, but at least they aren't mentioned. Picture the disciples reclining around the table. You would begin, of course, by saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The great lesson of the Exodus. And Jesus may have added, love your neighbor as yourself. Then you would begin the story, maybe by memory. You start out with that story, and you come to the first promise. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And your eyes flash, yes, God is going to bring us out. And at that point, the host would bless the cup the first time. One cup, four cups, I don't know. Now, the blessing almost certainly was there by Jesus' time. And we know that because the blessing was decided based on a debate between Hillel and Shammai, and it was resolved in their lifetime. And that's before Jesus' time. So the blessing went like this. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of everything, for giving us the fruit of the vine. Now, that seems to me to be the cup mentioned in Luke. Jesus takes a cup that he does not turn into the Lord's Supper, and he blesses it at the beginning of the meal. Then we come to the part where we say, I will set you free from being slaves. And just before you start eating, there's a second cup, the cup of being set free from being slaves. I don't see it mentioned in the Bible. Maybe they drank at that moment and went, yes, I hope it's the Romans this year. But praise God, we were set free from the Egyptians. At that point, the meal begins. And the meal begins with a dipping. Now, in the book of Exodus, there are three things required at Passover. Lamb, bread, which we've already mentioned, and bitter herbs. The bitter herbs to remind you of what it was like to be in bondage. I think, if you look in your text, it seems to me that that's the moment at which Jesus chooses to address the issue of his betrayal. So the dipping becomes the dipping in the bitter herbs. And I see him blessing the cup and saying, he will set us free from being slaves. And they're going, yes, that's awesome. And then Jesus said, yes, and one of you is going to turn me over. I don't think they immediately thought, well, it can't be me, because I haven't seen any Romans. I think they thought they would slip up somehow. And they began to say, is it me? Is it me? And Judas asked, is it me? And Peter said, John, ask him who. And Jesus said, it's someone who dips with me. And I think he took a piece of bread, which in their world was the silverware, and he dipped into the bowl of bitter herbs and gave it to Judas. And they tasted the bitterness of a different kind of bondage. It's a powerful teaching, if that's the way it went. Because it's not just, well, I'll dip with him so you know who it is. It wasn't clear because none of them seemed to get it. I think Jesus is saying, Egypt isn't the only bondage. And then comes the meal. Still the second drinking, now the meal. While they were eating, that's why I think that's exactly where it fit. While they were eating, Luke says, during the meal, Jesus took the matzo and said, this 
is my body. Now there's so much teaching in that, we couldn't live long enough to unpackage it. But at least see the stunning moment where he takes something out of the Passover, not to end the Passover, but to say, if you want the picture, put it in the Passover. I think it's a great instruction for Christians to use Passover to help to understand what Jesus said. This, this bread that represents your deliverance from bondage, this bread without yeast, this sinless bread, this bread today, it's striped and wounded. I don't think theirs was, but at least I see this bread is my body, my sacrifice, my offering. Eat it, all of you. Remember me. And every time from then on, they had Passover and had that unusual taste of unleavened bread. They remembered. And now the meal is finished. Now we drink a third time. That cup is called the cup of thanksgiving or blessing. Paul identifies it in Corinthians as the cup Jesus used to institute the Lord's Supper. In Luke it says, after supper, he took the cup. And I can say with some certainty that whatever cup that was, whether it was two or three, we know there's one before, we now know there's one after. Clearly, it's that cup after supper where you remember that great promise. The first one, I took you out. The second one, I set you free. And the third one, I redeemed you. And Jesus took that third cup and said, this cup, this redeem promise, is my blood offered for you. And he made a renewal, a new covenant, tying together Noah and Abraham and Moses and David in him. Drink from it, all of you. I think they sat as you did, in silence. Wow. What is this? It's not in the liturgy. The blood, he said, is poured out for many. that will come back. I think as they sat in silence, they waited for the last cup. That comes at the very end of the meal. That's the cup of, I will take you to myself. You will be my people. I will be your God. Remember take you? That's marriage language. Take you to myself, he says, and brought them to Sinai to marry them. And they waited for that cup, the cup of protection. But Jesus had said, I'm not going to drink again until I drink new. But Jesus, that night in Egypt, the Red Sea is ahead of us. Pharaoh showed up with 600 chariots. We needed God's protection that night. You sure you don't want to drink? I will not drink again. But Jesus, you said one of us will betray you. I heard the Sadducees are plotting. There's Romans out there. Are you sure? I will not drink again. And in some profound way, this rabbi, this messiah, this lamb of God, left the Seder 
without drinking to God's protection. I wonder. So Jesus took the ordinary, I don't know how I dare call it that, Seder, and it became one of the great teaching moments. The bitter herbs, now not only the bondage in Egypt, but whatever your bondage is. Eat bitter herbs this year and realize how terrible bondage is, whatever form it takes. The matzah, now not just bread without yeast, but now the manna from heaven. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives forever. If you go back to the first Passover, they were all standing. And when they finished the meal, they waited. The destroyer would pass that night. Hopefully they had blood on the doorpost. But I think after a thousand years of that, most Jewish people thought, when the meal's over, Passover's over. But for Jesus, like the ancient Hebrews the first time, Passover had only just begun because the destroyer still walks. Come. Let's go see. Okay, obviously there's <clears throat> more to the story, and uh, we'll we'll look at that next week. But isn't that a profound eye opener to to understand? You know, <laughs> one of the something for me, maybe for you too. The the Lord's Supper has always been kind of mysterious to me, and really. Um, wasn't really sure about what it all meant. And maybe that's part of that's normal. Uh, maybe we don't know what it all meant, but I sure appreciate Ray Vanderlaan helping me see the connection there and about what was going on there. And it makes a difference now when I think of the uh, liturgical Lord's Supper that we um, the practice in our version of Christianity, and there are several different ways, of course, of doing that, but uh, that's not a big deal. It's more about what what it stands for and what it means. So what do you think, folks? What did you, what'd you see there that was remarkable to you? Well, I've seen that before, that, that video, but one thing I didn't remember was what he started out with was the remember, what remember means in Hebrew, that it's hard to discuss that you, it's something that you're immersing yourself in, that is yeah. so, I forget his words, but there is a connection there. So there's a depth to it. And um, even to the point of, of uh, life-changing new right. connection with God, that, that kind of idea. And that's, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do some more look, reading on, on that, what yeah. that remember means in Hebrew. Uh, you know, that that's a, a, 
I think we we forget that we, to pardon the pun, so to speak. But um, we we've lost in our in our modern world we've lost a a depth of of understanding and connection. Okay, and you know we think we've got it all figured out, or we can figure it out, and so uh, we lose that deep. Um, profundity of, of dwelling in God and really letting that uh, remembering, remember what Jesus did. It's just, it maybe gets so routine, you know, yeah, he was crucified, raised again. Uh, yeah, cool. That was great. Um, no, that was that was a a, a, a transcendent uh, reconnection. He mentioned the the the, uh, the meal was a time of reconciliation. Remember where we've been, what what I've done. God says, "Remember what I've done," and let's let's get back to that. Let's let that or let that change you again. Let that impact you. Uh, let's be friends again. I'm willing. God says I'm willing. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's just a bigger deal than our routine has, what we've made it into a routine. It, if you see what I'm trying to say, remember, let it transform you, let it change you. You know, what, what has God done for you? What has he done in your life? Do you reflect on that? Do I, do I remember what I was and who I am now because of God? Uh, I, I do that at least some, and it's just, I even mentioned it earlier, the, how, how profound it is to, to see where I was and where I am. You know, <laughs> sometimes I feel like what an idiot I was. Uh, how could I have missed so much of what God had, had for me? And, um, uh, even even as I said too, people would would say that to me, and I would look at them like you're weird, you know, and just dismiss it. I'm busy. I got to take care of my thing here. Um, let's not do that. Let's let's let remember change us. What else, folks? I will. Bobby, yeah, uh, Larry. We, you, you made slight mention about next week. Is it, are you going to talk about the additional cup? I'm going to, I'm going to look for the next video after this one. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's good. Yeah. I think it is the, the fifth cup. Fifth cup. Yeah. That's probably the next one where they okay. went to the garden and, and Larry and I are talking about, cause we've yeah. seen it, but, uh, I'm pretty sure that's next in the sequence, and so but it it really it really we do need to see it because it, it is such a continuation of this as yeah. far as the meaning yeah. of of the Passover and Christ's sacrifice. It is so powerful. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the to the YouTube search right now when we finish and find the next one. Uh, so it will continue this and and yeah folks just like larry said i agree it's you, you need to be with us and see it it's um this this kind of set up what's coming and again ray vanderlaan does this over and over in all these things that were at least mysterious to me and i think to a lot of people he's 
he says, I mean, just think about what he said today, the talking about the Seder and the significance of the cups and what they did. And, and, uh, you know, I, I keep putting myself in there in the position of these disciples that were there. They understood that they, they knew what was going on. We we're cheated because we don't, <laughs> we, we American Gentiles don't <laughs> really uh, understand that, but to let him explain it, it just changes the significance of it to me and makes it much more profound and, and impactful. So I appreciate that and, uh, and how it helps me in my relationship to God. So yeah, we'll continue the, the, the next sequence here. Could I, could I interject one other thing? And I know I've, we probably both made mention it over, over a few times over time, but most of Ray von der Lange videos are maybe all of them, but certainly most of them are on YouTube. And if you, you can search for it by his name, Ray Vander, V-A-N-D-E-R-L-A-A-N. And is under the name of that the world may know, or at least most of the videos are, those are that the world may know. So you can type in that the world may know, or you can put in the initials of that phrase T T W M K. So there's three different ways you can search for it and just bring up all these videos. And uh, there's some really there's some that are you know two or five minutes long, but these that are real teaching lessons or typically the 30 minute long or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. It, look, look at them folks. It's, they're remarkable. Um, and uh, very, very helpful in your uh, discipleship and Christian growth. Great. Anybody else, anything that you want to share? This is, this is our time to be together and uh, talk to each other and share with each other, hold each other up. Well, listen, I want you all to have a, a blessed day. Uh, I'm looking forward to a, a better day again today than I, have been having and uh man i need to cut some grass out here <laughs> so if if it's not too muddy i may get out on the mower a little bit after a while but um it's I, I thought that's, that's why you hired a son-in-law yeah <laughs> well i i like the mower he'd probably be willing to do it but i i like my mower uh there'll come a day when it's his job that's for sure though <laughs> all right any anybody else uh, there, you are. there you are <laughs> howdy duty how are y'all doing you're great larry <laughs> i don't know how to drive the tractor but dakota does so it'll probably be her job first well, my problem is my son-in-law moved off to California and took the whole family. So now I got none of them. I ain't even got him to help anymore. <laughs> we'll, we'll have some tractor lessons uh, sooner or later. And uh, I'll give you your key here. <laughs> it's hanging on the hook in there. So I started to give that to you as a wedding present, but I chickened out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, love what you're you saying is you're, okay. you're rather over your daughter than your tractor is really what you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a much bigger deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, friends, love you all. Uh, let me let me send us out to be the light, to be uh, kingdom people. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you all in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you and me a spirit of wisdom and of revelation 
in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that we may know what is the hope to which he has called us. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the work of his great might. Be light, friends. Let's be light this week in Jesus' name. Let this be so. Amen. Love you all. Be blessed. Bye bye. See y'all. Bye, Kyra and Jennifer. Bye. Bye, Penny.